Uh, we're lucky tonight as a start to have Conor McBride, um, who's going to talk about something probably completely incomprehensible to me, um, but I'm sure really, really interesting. So thank you very much, Connor. Over to you. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can, uh, <laughs> I can make it at least slightly comprehensible. Um, it's, uh, it's a kind of exploration of what you can do in uh, independent Haskell these days. Uh, this may look a little bit like Haskell, but it's Agda. Uh, Phil Wadler made me write this file last week um, uh, to explain uh, a distinction that shows up, or, but also a similarity that shows up uh, in uh, well, two ways to talk about subsets. Uh, in a dependent type system. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to have a quick look at this, and then I'm going to see what happens when we try and play the same games in Haskell, and, and how far we get. Uh, so, uh, here's one way, to, is, is this legible at the back? I can do that. Um, right. um, so, one way to talk about subsets of X, is merely to take any to, to compute from a given element of X the set of proofs that you like it, right? that, that it's in the subset. So you map of um, uh, this, yeah, so, uh, you, uh, so a subset of X is just some predicate. You can think of it if you cross out set and write prop crossing over the Curry Howard correspondence, you're just saying, what's the predicate that characterizes the set? And you can see that this is clearly a covariant, so a contravariant definition. X is in the negative position. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, you can plug functions in backwards. Uh, meanwhile, there's another way, a covariant way, to talk about subsets of a given X. And that is to pick out the elements you like as the image of a function. So you just pick some set. So this says, first of all, pick a set I, and then give a function from I to X. So just give a function which hits the elements that are in the subset. Uh, and this is uh, covariant in X. And these are, are two not, I mean, they're two different, sometimes if you're lucky, equivalent ways to talk about the same idea. You can, you can talk about the predicate of being in the image of the function, and you can always construct a function uh, you can always con construct this I by just taking the pairs of elements that satisfy the predicate, and then the function itself is the first projection from those pairs. That works when you're interested in X's, which are small, but the fun happens when X's are large in terms of the set theoretic hierarchy. Haskell's gone type in type, so <laughs> we're lucky. Phil made me write down, just by way of example, uh, the, uh, the four subsets of two cooked both ways, I should add. Agda has no cumulativity, so if I want to take a, a small set and make it big, I have to wrap it in a record. That is deeply annoying. Another situation where type in type is a win. Um, so, uh, here I've got, you know, the, the empty set, the set containing true, the set containing false, and the set containing both, written, characterized as predicates. For the empty set, the predicate's always false. For the uh, case where it's true, well, we can look at the element, and uh, if we see the element true, we can say, yes, we like that, there's one proof that true is in the set, but uh, if it's false, nah, not having that. Uh, similarly for false, but the other way around. Here, um, for um, 
the predicate that's always happy to accept an element. We just we don't even bother looking at the element. We just say yes, that's fine. It's in the subset. So that's uh, that's subsets of two as predicates, and then for subsets of two as the image of a function. Uh, well, for the empty subset, I'm going to choose zero as the domain of my function, and then I don't have to do any work to point out which elements are in the subset. For the singletons, I pick one as the domain of my function, and I pick out the element I'm interested in, and uh, for the full set, I just pick two itself as the domain of the function and modulo this record packing the identity function as, as the thing that picks up the subset as an image. Uh, and what often happens with design choices in situations where you've got dependent types is that you need some notion of subset somewhere. You need to characterize the things you care about in one way or another. And you choose one of these two. It's not usually arbitrary. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you, choose, uh, you choose POW if you know the X in advance and you're trying to decide if you like it. And you choose FAM if you're trying to, if, you're, if you don't know the X yet and you're hoping to read it off from some other data, it comes afterwards. It's very much like deciding between doing uh, type checking and type synthesis. Uh, we're interested in characterizing you know, the, the types that have terms in them. Um, do we know the type in advance? If so, we would use a POW to do that. Or if we're trying to do type synthesis, uh, we might do it this way around. Um, so uh, the fact that POW and FAM do the same job in pragmatically very different ways changes uh, a lot of how we work. Uh, and I'm interested in it in particular because it gives rise to this rather lovely construction. Uh, a fan set, so yeah, if you take X to be set, um, a family of sets uh, determines a functor, which we call a container, in this way. Uh, the X's are going to be the elements that are contained, and we're going to pack a bunch of them up in a way that's determined by, uh, by a fan set. So this C is a set, and R is a function from C to set. And maybe I'll do a spot on the fly alpha conversion to some more suggestive names in this context. S, so I'm calling them S and P for shape and position. On a different day, I call them C and R for command and response. Uh, so the idea is that you build a container by choosing what shape you want. And then once you've chosen the shape, P tells you what positions there are for elements in that shape. And you give a function that looks up for each position what element is stored. So this is a data structure determined by a fan set. And it, you, it's the natural way of doing this independent type theory uh, because uh, you don't have to pack up inside your data structure any large information. Uh, if you want to switch out this fan set for a POW set, uh, you, um, uh, the, the size you end up with goes up by one. It gets <laughs> theoretically large because you're packing up a set inside the data structure. This is not happy. And, these things are typically used in, this is Martin Lerf's W type, the kind of universal inductive data structure, where you just say, we're going to have tree-like stuff, and every node is built with one of these containers of substructures. So you just choose what are the shapes the nodes can be, and then when you pick a shape, you give a function 
from positions to soft trees and you keep going until you choose a shape that has no positions. Um, okay, so this is containers which have recursive data structures as their fixed points. Uh, here, for example, is the natural numbers cooked this way. All we say is uh, there are two kinds of nodes, zero nodes and successor nodes. Successor nodes have one position, Zero nodes have two positions, have no positions. Uh, picking this FAM set, plugging it in here, gives us the natural numbers. So it's a very generic data structure described by this container like thing. So it's very often convenient whether or not this is a good data structure to work with. It's good to know whether your container-like functor has a presentation in terms of shapes and positions, because there are some useful constructions that are generic, given the hard data of the FAM set that determines the container. So uh, a little while ago, I thought, well, nah, how close can I get to doing this in Haskell uh, with the FAM set? And that's a kind of perverse thing to think, right? If X is set here, then pound, pound set is set arrow set, and we have a kind star arrow star in Haskell. But kind of things go backwards there. Uh, you know, you have to start from the family of positions and choose a shape that is appropriate to your family of positions, rather than reading the positions off from the choice of shape. This thing, fan set, does not, uh, does not really correspond to haskell -y stuff, because we're, we're choosing a set kind of as data and then immediately uh, we end up having you know, a, a, a larger pattern. We, we need functions from value types to set, to make fan set this way. And that's a much tougher ask. But it's not impossible. So let's do it. <laughs> so, I should add, of course, the uh, I wouldn't dare do this with a, a cheat sheet, and this is my cheat sheet, and I didn't mean to look at that. But I will just grab this. And park it here. Right, is this legible? Right. Uh, yeah. I'll just shove this sideways. Okay. So, uh, what do we do in dependent Haskell to have things living at, at the value level and the type level at the same time? We use singletons. So, uh, the idea here is that my container structure has shapes and positions, but shapes are no longer a set. Shapes are going to be the family of singletons indexed by the type that I wish was the type of shapes. <laughs> so S is, S is some kind or other. Is it singletons so that I can represent them at runtime? And then I can perfectly well have a, a type family of positions indexed by static shapes. So S is static shapes, sh is dynamic shapes, and PO is positions indexed over static shapes. So hopefully singletons will keep everything, the, the dynamic shapes tied to the static shapes. And then what's our data structure? You choose a dynamic shape which will fix the static shape and then you give a function from positions to elements. Okay, um, I should probably, well okay, first thing to do for this is to construct a functor instance, right? No, no good without 
uh, without that. So functor shape <coughs> position where f map f, and someone's going to give us an s, and I always call the function k because in another life it's a continuation. And, um, uh, and then let's see what, what we've got. I've got a type hole. Uh, what am I supposed to be making? I'm supposed to be making a container full of bees. Fine, I'll do that by making, giving it two pieces. Now I've got two holes, I can't see a thing. Um, but uh, in the first instance, this is one of the joys of, of type holes. It's not very good at simplifying the constraint, so it tells me that, well, no, that's legitimate, actually. It, it tells me I, I know something with a shape, and I want something with a shape, and I hope I get to choose S0, because if so, I can shove S in this hole. Um, okay, and so far, it's, I don't think, I haven't got an error, that's a relief, uh, but I've got a hole from positions to B, um, and what have I also got? Um, What's K? K is from positions to A, and F goes from A to B. I think we are quids in by composition. So that's F after K. Hooray! Uh, we've built a functor instance. Uh, you know, just, I mean, we, I mean, essentially, we just see that these x's are sitting in the image of a, in the image of a function. Of course, we can compose another thing onto this, keeping the shape the same. Uh, I'm just going to grab my cheat sheet because <coughs> otherwise I'll forget what I wanted to say. Uh, okay, right. Let's have an example. This is a good example. Um, Um, so, uh, what would happen? What do you think the, the container uh, oh, sorry, this should, I'm in Haskell, I'm saying natty. Right, so what have I done? I've defined the natural numbers. And then I've defined the singletons for the natural numbers. Is everybody familiar with this singletons trick? Um, and then I've defined what it is to be a finite set, or I have defined a collection of finite sets whose size are given by their index. So you can see there are no elements of fin zero. And then for fin suck n, I embed all of the elements of fin n, and I chuck in a new one. So there are always n elements of fin n. So if the shapes are given by numbers, and if you choose a number n, there are n positions, what data structure are we talking about? Of We're talking about lists. Uh, I have a so, question, actually. Yeah? So uh, the position uh, must be a type constructor, and the shape must be a type constructor. Are there any constraints on these type constructors at all? Or do they have to be special kind of functors or uh, So, not really. Uh, morally, uh, the shape type constructor ought to be a singleton. But it doesn't really matter if it isn't, because if there's more than one thing, or if you've got multiple elements in a shape type. That just means that there's information stored in the node that is not being used to determine the positions. So pretty much they're unconstrained. All that matters is that they're synchronizing on S. You know, apart from that, it's just data. 
And actually, that's kind of the point. We're getting structure out, but we're not putting any in. Um, right, going to uh, grab this thing and uh, let's let's write some stuff. Right, I am. Um, um, uh, we're going to be building lots of kind of natural transformations. So, uh, uh, so I like to to hide the mess um, uh, and talk about <coughs> essentially. So this is natural transformations from S to T, preserving the element type. So now we can talk about uh, two list is going to be. A natty fin container. Right, no element types are on. Gone, we've gone point three. Uh, let's see if we can write this thing. Um, well, there's two possibilities for the shape. And in either case, So we pattern match on the singleton, and that tells us something uh, about the, um, uh, actually, I'll call that an undefined. It's good to look at one hole at a time. Um, so uh, this is one of these funny situations. We're supposed to be producing a list. We've been told that the shape of our input is zero. That's to say the length of our input is zero. Um, so we probably want to give back nil. But what if we um, what if we try our only chance of getting an element for the output type is from this k function. And disturbingly, it's telling us that k goes from thin s to i. Because it's not bothering to simplify the constraints when it gives us a type holds output. So it looks temptingly like we might be able to cheat and give back a non empty list. But when we try, let's just apply k to the finite zero. Right, now it says actually it was a function from fin z you wanted. There's no way we're going to produce one. So Tough luck, folks. We're going to have to give back the empty list after all. Um, meanwhile, we have learned enough to produce the head of the list. We know that uh, our position set is definitely in fin of some successor. So f said the finite zero is definitely an element. So we should be able to get an element for our list by applying k to the, the position we know must exist. And so far, that's good. What about the rest of the list? Well, we need to recall two lists recursively. Uh, and uh, I've gone as far as saying that the, the tail of the list is going to be length n. Um, and now I have to explain where the, where the elements are going to come from. So I know there's only one place they can come from. They can only come from k. So I suspect, without fear of contradiction, that this is going to be k after something. Now what's the type of the whole? Fin something to fin something else that we don't, and that we haven't been told quite enough about. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Well, it's the finite set one smaller, and we've already collected the one that is in the image of fizz. So we need to collect all of the ones that aren't. That's to say the ones in the image of 
fuss. We're here. It's alive. Um, it's a fun game to play the other way around. So this time, uh, we're, um, uh, if we get an empty list, we're going to give back the zero shape. And then we can write, somebody's going to give us a position, and it's not really going to check. Well, if I switched on the warnings, I could check whether that covered all the cases. But because we've chosen the singleton zero, the position P is indefinitely in fin Z, and this is an exhaustive case analysis of fin Z. Um, <clears throat> if we have x cons x's, then what I'm going to do is case from list x's, and that's going to give me a pair of a number and a function that packs up uh, the x's. Um, oh, well, that should be uh, one of those. <coughs> Open the parens, and I'm going to give back the successor of n, and now I have to get my position. And this time, when I look at the position, there are two possibilities. Either it's the zero position, in which case I'm giving back the x element, or it's a successor position. <coughs> in which case I should be able to apply k to it. So k is the function that packs up the x's. All I have to do is map successor positions to the image of k, and uh, the new position, the zero position, to the, to the head of the list. So we've managed to go back and forth. Right. Everybody happy so far? Um, so I'll do, I'll speed up a little. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, um, uh, I have a terrible penchant for, let me just, uh, defining infix operators which take three arguments but are uh, intended to be used in a higher order style. So this is the kit with which you make polynomial functors. We have the identity functor, the constant functor, sums and products. Uh, and here's all of their uh, functor instances. The good news is that all of these constructors uh, work for containers. Um, so we can take, we can directly compute uh, the you know, shapes and positions for, in particular, um, sums and products. Um, but uh, I don't just want to do that. I want to manufacture the equipment for these structures in terms of container morphisms. Right, because that's fun stuff. Uh, I'll grab very carefully those things. That doesn't give too much of the game away. Uh, except, of course, I have to define morph f. Um, oh, underscore. And then I get an enormous hole. Uh, right. Um, so this, this data family <coughs> trick uh, just lets me essentially pattern match on containers to define a type. Right. The question I'm asking is this. What are the polymorphic functions between containers? 
Well, let's think about it. You don't know the element type. You do know the shapes and positions of your input container. You do know the shapes and positions of your output container. You're trying, somebody gives you uh, a sh an input shape and a function from positions to elements. Is the function any use to you at the moment? No, because you don't know anything about elements, right? You have to produce an output, yeah, you have to produce an output shape. What can you, what information can you use to produce the output shape? <coughs> the input shape. Only the input shape. <coughs> okay. Uh, meanwhile, uh, for every output position corresponding to that output shape, you have to deliver an element. Where can that element possibly come from? From some position in the input. So without talking about elements at all, we can say what the polymorphic functions are. Uh, they are functions which map input shapes to output containers whose elements happen to be input positions. That's to say the coordinates of where you're going to get the element from. And then how do you apply one of these morphisms to an actual container, uh, well, what you do is you take the input shape, you apply your morphism to it, that gives you a container full of input positions, but hang on a minute, we've got a function from input positions to elements, so we just need to map that across the result. So that's how we interpret one of these morphisms as a polymorphic function. Uh, so that's half the battle won. Um, but, uh, but I claim not only are these, uh, do these things represent polymorphic functions, they represent all the polymorphic functions. So if somebody gives me a polymorphic function between containers, how do I construct this morphism? Let's do it. <coughs> so I've got a, my packing up, I pack up my constructor with morph, and then someone is going to give me an input shape. Now I what? Um, I've got a nice big hole where, uh, where I want an output container. Right. I could get an output container uh, if only uh, if only I could apply. Uh, my polymorphic function to something. And the polymorphic function doesn't care what the elements are. So the fact that I know what I want, um, well, hmm. is that a good move? Is that a good move? Yes, it almost certainly is. Um, uh, well, yeah, and I could at least, Fill in, the, I have to provide an input to that polymorphic function, and I've got as far as knowing what shape I can feed in. So let's see what the hole is. Oh, well, funnily enough, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're supposed to produce a structure full of output positions. That's what we're being asked for. The polymorphic function is willing to do that uh, if, um, uh, if it gets, sorry, we're supposed to produce input 
um, an output structure full of input positions. We can only do that if the input structure is full of input positions. And we can very easily achieve that simply by mapping each input position to itself. Uh, so we, uh, as ever in these games, you instantiate your polymorphic thing to the identity function. Uh, category theorists in the room are entitled to ask, isn't that just the Yone dilemma? And uh, yes, it is. Um, so we have a, represent, a representation theorem for all the polymorphic functions between containers. This is a powerful tool if you're interested in ans answering questions like, uh, is there any way this container could possibly be applicative or a monad? Uh, because it tells you that if there are, if the, the, the polymorphic functions that are the implementations of the methods of the class, if they exist, they're going to have this form. They're going to manipulate uh, containers in this way. So in particular, uh, you, you can never have an applicative functor without having a monoid on its underlying notion of shape. Um, you know, essentially, uh, applicative functors are monoids that talk back. Uh, you, do, you, you have to have a monoid on the shapes, but then you have to map each position to the two positions in the input that you're going to, the one you're going to get your function from and the one you're going to get your uh, argument from. Uh, and all the applicatives are up of that form. They can't, they can't not be. Um, okay. Um, and actually, um, yeah, I'll do, uh, I'll do sums. Um, and then I'll have an applicative finale. Um, and I think I'm just going to point at sums. No, actually, I won't. I'll do products. I'll do products. Here are products. Um, Right. Um, so let's just think about um, we're, we're trying to build pairs of container structures. Uh, we've got uh, we're trying to build pairs from S naught, you know, shape, you know, the left shapes are S naught, left positions P naught, left shape, uh, right shapes S one, right positions P one. So we know the shapes on both sides. We want to take effectively the pairs of the containers. So, uh, what should the shapes of the pairs be? It's a pair of shapes. It's a pair of shapes. We need to know the shape of the thing on the left, and we need to know the shape of the thing on the right. So that's what this thing does for for singletons. It says if we know the singletons for left shapes and we know the singletons for right shapes then we can build the singletons for the pair of shapes. Just give me a singleton for each component. Now, what about the positions? Where are the things in a pair? Either the left or the right. Either in the left or the right. So we have to use this construction. We get a pair of shapes so static shapes, so we have to say what are the positions are, and we know the positions for the two things. Uh, so we need to choose either a left position or a right position. So our pair-like structures are, uh, our pairs of containers are given by pairing the singleton shapes and choosing the positions. Um, and then we can see that we can actually uh, take a pair of stuff and, and build the corresponding things. Somebody gives us an S0K0 and an S1K1, 
uh, and that tells us that we want to choose S0, S1 as our pairs of shapes, we get a position, we have to look at it to see if it was a left one, in which case we go with K0, or a right one, in which case we go with uh, K1. And I can build the two projections from pairing as container morphisms. Uh, what do I have to do? Uh, Any time I get a pair coming in, I have to map it uh, to a target shape. If I'm doing a left projection, that means I'm going to take uh, my pair of input shapes and pick the left one. And then my function that maps output positions uh, to input positions just says the thing in a position in a P note, all we're going to do is wrap it with a take from the left operator, and that gives us an output position. So this is saying take the elements from the left, choose a left shape and take the elements from the left. So remember, this thing tells you where your elements are coming from. So this is uh, left shape, take from the left, and in the right projection, right shape, take from the right. But you notice that the kinds of Perry and choosy are the same. Um, so we earlier said that Natty Finn was lists. What? Um, so we know that Perry Natty Natty Choosy Fin Fin still can't spell uh, Choosy Fin Fin. Those are pairs of lists. We just figured that out. What do you think those things are? Yes, they are lists of lists, but not just any old lists of lists. Lists of lists, lists, lists of lists that are all the same shape. That is to say, rectangular matrices. We are saying that a shape consists of choosing the dimensions, and a position consists of choosing a coordinate in each of those dimensions. So we have this operator, it's, it's called tensor, that we can't in Haskell do of two functors. We can't, there's no handy type constructor that we can feed list and list to that will give us the rectangular matrices. But we can take the tensor of containers. Um, so that's, that's a nice thing. And it, it leads me to the place <coughs> where I want to get to. And I wonder how much of that. Um, I think I probably just have to do uh, show and tell, or maybe I'll uh, I'll maybe I'll hack the last, but just for the finale of fun. Um, um, so, I'm going to up my game now um, and build things whose shapes are lists in order to build with lists that live at the type level have to go with singleton for lists. Uh, so XE is the parameter. It says, uh, so the, the Y suffix <laughs> is always my singleton. Uh, you know, what it's like to be an X. Um, and then X's is the type level uh, list that we want to make the value level singleton for. So Nilly is the singleton for nil. And Conzi takes an XEX -X and a listy X's and makes a listy X Cons X's. 
Okay, so we've got singleton lists. And then I'm going to build a few useful gadgets. So, um, I mean, this is the, the joy of dependent Haskell. You have to write all your programs, uh, you know, goodness knows how many times. Um, so I write append on type level lists. And then I write append on singleton lists making the promise that what you compute when you append singleton lists is the singleton for their type level concatenation. Um, I mean, it's just append, right? No. Uh, but what we weren't expecting to be able to do with singletons and type level append is to run append backwards, hence Never. Um, uh, if, uh, if we've got the original singletons for x's and y's, and we've got a listy for their concatenation, but instead of storing x-y things, we just store any old p's, then I should be able to split this listy apart and get a listy of p's for the x's and a listy of p's for the y's. And sure enough, and yes, I can, uh, in, in the obvious way. If, we're, you know, if the first list is, is nilly, then that means that all of our p's coming in belong in the second component. Uh, if our listy coming in is consy, that means our p's must also be consy, so I can stash the P for later, split up P's into the prefix and the suffix of the tail, and then consy the P back onto the prefix. So I can do that split. Um, okay, so roll sleeves up to point out that there is an instance of applicative for uh, listy shapes container listy positions. I think I hope I've got that right. Um, um, and I hope I don't have to cheat, but I'll cheat if I have to. Got lots of, have I only got holes or have I got actual errors? No, I've only got holes, good. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, what goes on? We've got to build a, a container whose shape is a list, uh, and uh, guess what, folks? We don't know about any, we, we, we're polymorphic in the element type, in the element singleton, so we don't really have a choice <laughs> in which list to pick. Um, uh, so that's, we've got to pick nilly, and then we can even, check that the only position we can get back from that is nilly, and in that position I should put my off there. I could do this all on one line. And the only element I can put there is the only one I put. Um, and uh, well, to make that undefined for a moment and just check that everybody's happy. Okay, good. Um, right. So, um, I've got, uh, I've got function shapes and a function continuation. I've got argument shapes and an argument continuation. Um, my only chance of getting a function out of this continuation is to supply a list of positions corresponding to all of these shapes. My only chance of getting an argument about out of this continuation is to supply 
a, um, uh, a bunch of positions corresponding to all of these shapes. So I've got no alternative. I have to ask for the concatenation. And then back will come a position. But now I need to split them up. I can say case Dnepa, I can spell Dnepa um, with F's and A's, but I'm really splitting up P. Well, I have a new line here. Oh, and hopefully that will give me a function position, bunch of function positions and a bunch of argument positions. How are we doing? Uh, just a whole, good. Then if we're really lucky, we can finish with feeding the function positions to the function continuation. That should give us a function. The argument positions uh, should be fed to the argument continuation, uh, continuation and that should give us an element of the argument type. So you get FP, oh, not SP. So, uh, yeah, FP. Right, module loaded. So uh, what we have here, so this listy listy thing is, uh, is the iteration of, uh, of the tensor. You choose, uh, you choose either to stop or uh, you choose to make another step, you choose another shape, and that's going to add another element to the tuple of the result. You notice, so here, because they're constrained to have the same static list, we're giving a matching bunch of shapes at the start, uh, sorry, a bunch of shapes at the start, and we'll get back a matching bunch of positions. So it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like having a, uh, a bunch of commands in a punch card deck where you don't get to look at the output from the first command before you choose the next command. It's just a list of them. And then, you know, that generates some line printer output. This is computing in the 60s. So what we're doing is iterating tensor as often as we like, exactly the way that free monads iterate functor composition as often as you like. A functor composition, but if you think about what container composition would mean, it's really hard to express in Haskell. Container composition is you choose your first shape and then you wait till you see the second shape. This, this, like, you wait till you see the position that's picked before you say what shape sits there. And then you get your second position. So think again, lists of lists, they're ragged. You get to choose the length of the inner list depending on where you are in the outer list, which is not what happens with tensor. So that's why monads behave like interactive computing in the 1970s, where you're sitting at a teletype and you see the response to your first command before you choose your next command. Uh, whereas applicatives are like programming in the 60s. Uh, they're, um, uh, they're this batch mode thing and you know fundamentally applicatives are the iteration of container tensor monads of container composition that's what's going on there so hopefully just a little look into the container world <laughs> i was really surprised by how much of it i could hack up here is uh, is a door into seeing deeper structure in in what's going on around this i'll stop there Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a write up or are you going to have a write up for this? So, some of it's on my blog, um, uh, but this, this last applicative bit uh, I decided to do about 15 minutes before I got here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I wondered how easy it would be to hack up, and it turned out to be. All right, um, but uh, yeah. So there's a, I have a blog post with the same title as the talk. I, I, mean, I, I may even have, have linked to it. Um, so um, you know, given that at least in, in my parlance, um, 
Uh, Hasekism is the name for trying slightly too hard to imitate dependent types in Haskell. Uh, uh, so they, these are uh, these are Hasekistic containers, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you can do tensor because it's just pairing, and you can do these things because it's making lists. It's making those uh, chains of functions and representing those as singletons. Representing higher order stuff as singletons, uh, not really working at the moment, but who knows. Um, no type level lambda, that's the reason. Yeah. So I, um, I'm trying to visualize the class of functors that are containers in this sense. So are there functors, so, so far, Probably all polynomial functors are containers. Sure are. Well, because, we of, your, because of your constructions, you can start with uh, the two i and k yeah. and build up, right? Yeah, yeah. What are other examples of uh, 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 functors that are not polynomial and that are containers? Uh, well, or yeah. maybe maybe functors that are not containers. Also. Right. So the functors that are not containers, full stop. Continuations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so containers characterize strictly positive things. So anything that relies on double negation, it's still going to be a functor. It's not going to be a container. You're not going to be able to characterize it in terms of, of you're not going to be able to bottle what its shapes are in any particularly useful way. Um, uh, so uh, uh, meanwhile, you know, pretty much everything else, I mean, everything strictly positive uh, is going to be a container. Uh, sometimes, if you want to do the constructions that show it, you need to, uh, to generalize. So, like, if you want to build, uh, so if you, want, if you want to see lists as, as a fixed point, uh, do the usual thing where you take the fixed point of a bifunctor to get lists then you need to generalize to containers with more than one sort of payload. And there are various ways you can do that. You can say, well, I'm just going to have one notion of shape, but two notions of positions, the positions for the x's and the positions for the y's. And then you can take a fixed point uh, in one of them. Or a better move, uh, more in the spirit of the piece, is to move to indexed containers. So there. Um, for index containers, we replace all of these stars by I arrow star, <laughs> but everything still works. Um, uh, and, uh, and that allows us to say, oh, well, actually, we've got different sorts of nodes, and you can plug different sorts of things into them, and there's just a kind that, the, the kind of sort of Lego connections that have to, to plug together. And index containers are, are closed under fixed point constructions. They're closed under differentiation. They're, uh, you know, lots of, they have lots of differential operators that build zipper constructions. Uh, and the you know, index containers are, are a, a world of fun. Um, uh, and and we, we just about have them uh, in, the, in the Haskell setting. Um, but yeah, uh, these uh, um, doubly negated things are, are, uh, are beyond us. And, and that's not a bad thing. Um, uh, they're, uh, I mean, they're. They're, they're, they're wild system F voodoo stuff, they are. Um, uh, they're, they're, they, can, they can usually, if you're lucky, be replaced by something concrete that does the same job. Um, not always. Um, so yeah, there's, um, uh, I mean, these are the fiddly things to work with. I don't pretend that this is a particularly convenient way of encoding arbitrary data structures. It's more just an interesting exploration to do to kind of x-ray the structure of the data that you usually use. Uh, and if you're asking, is this, uh, uh, you know, 
what are the polymorphic functions between these types? It's not a crazy thing to do to say, well, what are those containers? Um, can I give the function the shape the function on shapes one way, the function on positions the other way? And what you know, what laws what laws should be satisfied? You you discover uh, for example, for applicative, that uh, the operations that you need on shapes, you need uh, something that takes the unit type to a single shape and uh, something that takes two shapes to one shape. Uh, and funnily enough, the applicative laws under those circumstances degenerate to the monoid laws. Um, uh, Is that sufficient? Is that sufficient? It's not sufficient because you also have to say what happens with the positions and that has to be compatible with the monoidal behavior on the shapes. But, uh, but you certainly can't start making an applicative unless you've got a monoid on the shape, and then you still have work to do. <laughs> um, uh, so, there's, uh, uh, so the same sort of thing happens with, uh, with monads. If you're trying to say what a join is, uh, instead of it being like a kind of multiplication for shapes, it's a kind of integration for shapes because you've got an outer shape and then you're ranging over the inner positions and you've got a different shape in each position. Convolution. Yeah. Uh, cool. Any other questions for Colin? Yeah. I'm just curious, what would you say is the uh, most sophisticated language now for foundations of mathematics? Um, well, that's a fluid situation. Uh, the, I'd say that in five years' time, cubicle type theory will have knock, knocked the spots off everything currently going. Um, it's, uh, it's not there yet, but it has got off the ground. Um, so, um, uh, whether uh, so that whether that materializes as uh, a major cubicle injection into Agda or as a further development of the cubicle prototype in Gothenburg, um, that's uh, uh, that's good news. Um, and keep an eye on what's going on in Pittsburgh uh, because Bob Harper's gang are uh, are getting their act together in that respect as well. John Sterling's red pearl tool is going to turn into a thing. Um, at the moment, it depends what kind of mathematics you want to formalize. It's very noticeable that the major success stories in Koch have deliberately been about very finitary things, where the usual sorts of miseries you get in intentional type theories about extensionality and goodness knows what are not going to bite. You know that's why that's why four color theorem. That's why classification of finite groups. Uh, it's a very it's been a very successful tool for a very particular kind of mathematics. Um, and yeah, I mean, okay, and, and of course one one might be you know biased towards type theory, but people have done amazing things. John Harrison has done amazing things in whole light. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the library of, of formalized mathematics in Mizar is, is pretty spectacular. Uh, so not so suitable for, for programming, but real success stories there in terms of, uh, of doing hard Hard sums. Any last questions? Great, okay, we'll take a few minutes break. Um, thanks again, Connor, for this talk.